In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Good morning. I greet you with great joy today. You know I'm blessed to serve those who are imprisoned. I visit um, at the prison in Soledad with a handful of criminals. One of them was baptized a few months ago. Constantine is his name now. And uh, he draws a, a few more. And when God allows for me to visit with them, is the most humbling experience that I wish you could too have sometimes. This is the highest security facility, a yard that has criminals that have repented, that have given up the gang activity. Recently, the state of California passed a law that calls upon the prisons to mix the ones who have repented, who have ran away from the gangs, protected in prison, with those who are still active members in the gangs. What this means is war. These, many of these people, including Constantine, are being, have been chased for many years, tried, the, the gangs trying to kill them. And now, being separated from the active members, they enjoyed, so to say, protection. But with this law that I find quite diabolic, this is to end. And I, I talked to them point blank when I visited the last time. What does it mean for you? And they said, probably our end. I said, do you fear the end? And uh, Constantine said, no. I want to be baptized Orthodox, to confess my sins, to be forgiven, and to receive the Lord. I'm ready to go. Constantine had been in the shoe or in the pit, as they call it, which is the place of confinement, of isolation, with no, without seeing the light of the day for 17 years. Only a couple of times a week he was taken out in a cage to see other criminals like him walking in a small sight. Because of this, his sight was damaged, not seeing the sunlight for so many years. And now, when he's in the presence of light, he sheds tears involuntarily because the light troubles him. So I talked to them about being ready. And I told him, Constantine, you must be ready. The first opportunity I have, I'll, I'll come to you. And we do two things. Confession. And you receive the holy gifts, the body and blood of the resurrected Christ. And confession is so important. And we talked about it for a little while. My prayer was that the other one who's orthodox will come to his senses and say, Father, my time has come too to take a turn. Instead, another man who was not orthodox, a good man, modeled, shaped by the Protestants who minister in the prison, who probably never heard of confession, step up and said, Father, can I do confession? And almost in, in tears, I had to tell him, I'm so sorry, you are not an Orthodox Christian. This is a mystery of the church, a sacrament reserved for the Orthodox Christians who are baptized and who fight against these dark, dark spirits and against the, uh, the spiritual host of the wickedness. So I had to turn him down. I had to turn him down. And how I wept in my heart thinking about confession, as many called it, the forgotten medicine. How in our church, at large now, in the Greek Orthodox Church in America, the great mystery of confession and repentance is neglected. And yet, according to the fathers of the church, is what enables us to do everything, including to follow Christ into the kingdom. Repentance and confession is the topic of my homily today. Inspired by the season that the church has instituted for us to follow. That calls not only to prayer and fasting, 
but also to regular confession in preparation for the great feast of the Nativity of the Lord. Repentance and confession cannot be separated. The one who truly repents approaches Christ in confession and hears the prayer of the priest and feels the, the weight of the cross upon his head as the prayer of forgiveness is read. And the one who confesses cannot do this properly unless he or she repents. Repentance, the beautiful weapon that the Lord himself taught us, the beautiful virtue that the saints of the church teach us, the beautiful virtue that many in the world quietly cultivate. One of those who is known to the world until a few decades ago, until 1991, when he died, a man of extreme humility, patience, is Saint Porphyrios, who died on this day in 1991. A simple man who went to the monastery by the will of God, lived his life in purity, took the Orthodox Christian life seriously. This was his calling through fasting and repentance and learning from the, the ones who are more advanced, facing spirit, physical issues because of being too harsh on him, he had to return to the world. He was assigned to serve as a chaplain at the chapel of a hospital in Athens where he served for 30 years. From 1970, he returned to this hut of his Capso Calivio, Mount Athos, the place where he started with great obedience to his elders. He returned and ended his life after he started a convent, a monastery of nuns. He's the man whose presence in the world touched many who did confession with him. A man who was clairvoyant, but he could also tell others about their struggles to come. He could tell when the great event was happening in the world around the globe, would this be a typhoon or some personalities dying. This man is recorded in audio. You can hear him serving the divine liturgy. He was interviewed by the nuns. There are books written with his words. And today we celebrate him as one of the holy ones up there with a cloud of the angels of the saints and in our midst through the prayers and the services that we have celebrated last night and today. Saint Porfirios tells us a little bit about his life and about his repentance. Just a few months before he died, he wrote a letter to those who were his spiritual children. And I would like to read to you this letter in order to, for us all to learn about repentance and confession. Elder Porfirios, Saint Porfirios writes, My dear spiritual children, now that I am still in charge of my faculties, I want to give you some advice. Ever since I was a child, I was always in sin. When my mother sent me to watch the animals on the mountain, my father had gone to America to work on the Panama Canal for us, his children, because we were poor. There, where I, where I shepherded the animals, I slowly read, word by word, the life of St. John the hut dweller, and I loved St. John very much. I said a lot of prayers, like the young child that I was, 12 or 15 years old, I don't remember too well. I wanted to follow his example. So with a lot of difficulty, I secretly left my parents and came to Capso Calivia on the Holy Mountain. I became obedient to two elders, the true brothers, Pandeleimon and Ioannikios. They happened to be very devout and full of virtue. I loved them very much. And because of that, with their blessing, I gave them absolute obedience. That helped me a lot. I also felt great love for God and got along very well. However, because of my sins, God allowed me to become ill. 
and my elders told me to go to my parents in my village of St. John on the island of Evia. Although I had sinned a lot from when I was a small child, when I returned to the world, I continued to commit sins, which today are very many. The world, however, thought highly of me, and everyone shouts that I'm a saint. I, however, feel that I'm the most sinful person in the world. Of course, whatever I remembered, I confessed. And I know God has forgiven me. But now I have the feeling that my spiritual sins are very many, and I ask all those who have known me to pray for me, because for as long as I lived, I humbly prayed for you too. Now that I'm leaving for heaven, I have the feeling that God will say to me, what are you doing here? I have only one thing to say to him. I am not worthy of here, Lord, but whatever you love wills, I'll do it for me. From then on, I don't know what will happen. I, however, wish for God's love to act. I always pray that my spiritual children will love God, who is everything, so that he will make us worthy to enter his earthly, uncreated church. We must begin from here. I always made the effort to pray, to read the hymns of the church, the holy scriptures, and the lives of the saints. May you do the same. I tried, by the grace of God, I tried to approach God, and may you also do the same. I beg all of you to forgive me for whatever I did to upset you. Signed, Hieromonk Porfirios, June 91. Now, how do we take this as repentance, huh? In his book, Wounded for Love, which is a book that, if you haven't read, you must read. We'll pick it up again as a group to read here. St. Porfirios talks about repentance and confession. And when we think about it, living in the Western world here, we're so influenced by Western Christianity. I would say those who grew up in this country, it's in your blood. You must fight this because the Westerners, if they still have confession here and there in the Roman Catholic Church, the rest took it out as a sacrament. They look at it as a legalistic act. Justice might be served. The guilty one comes to the judge, the verdict is proclaimed, the penance is given. Not only this, but it's according to a particular bin in which we fall as a category of sin. The church, brothers and sisters, has not operated like this when it came to confession. This is an act that the Lord himself, God himself, through the Bible, Old Testament and New Testament, called upon his people to do, to confess their sins, to receive the mercy of God, to be forgiven. This is preceded by repentance, as St. John said. Repent, for the kingdom of heavens is at hand. Repent. In the Orthodox Church, we don't know the word, the word guilt. If you've heard it, then you must have opened a Roman Catholic book. We suffer the consequences of the sin of Adam and Eve. We're not guilty of that. How would this child be guilty of Adam and Eve? And their sin of disobedience? No, we suffer the consequence of that. But we, what we do have in the church is sin that brings death, repentance, confession, forgiveness, and light. Just like the man who was in the prison for 17 years not seeing the light, when he came out in the world, wow, tears fell down. The mystery of repentance and confession does the same for the one who confesses, especially the one who hasn't confessed in a long time. Months, years, maybe a lifetime. Maybe a lifetime. The priest is not the judge. The confession is done to Christ. The priest is the representative of the community. 
In the early centuries, you know this, the confessional was done publicly. We were to come one by one in the front of the, of the people and confess our sins. As the church grew and became impractical, the priest represents the community, and he's the one who reads that prayer. The penance is not for punishment, but for correction and growth, for fighting the enemy and the forces of the darkness, for remedy and further repentance. So I beg you to think about these things and what you have thought all along about confession as a legal duty. It is not legal, but it is a duty. The fathers of the church talk about this as a mandatory thing for one to be saved. It's not an option. Why do you think it would be a sacrament in the church if it was optional? You know what the first thing Christ did after his resurrection when he met the disciples locked in the room of fear? We hear about this Sunday of the resurrection. When some of us are at the picnic instead of being here to hear this. They are locked in the room and the Lord tells them, peace be with you three times. Receive the peace of God. Why? You go out in the world. Whosoever sins you remit, they are remitted unto them. And so whoever sins you retain, they are retained. And that through ordination was transmitted today through bishops and priests, made available for us in the community to take advantage of it. So if there's anything that I can do as your priest for your salvation, it is to hear your confession. Absolutely. If I'm given five minutes with, one, with, you, of, with you, before the criminals, the devils will come to end us, this would be it. So, yes, the unexpected snatch by death is something that comes in as a fear. I die and I'm not prepared. Good. The Holy Father say, also by avoiding confession, repentance and confession, we go on a path of abandoning the grace of God. The grace of God bestowed to us. We run away from it. And we get into the mood of becoming normal without the grace of God. And the church cannot exist without the grace of God. As long as the grace of God invites us, as it happens today, in every liturgy and through my word today, we are obliged to approach continuously. We are obliged, St. Nectario says, to hasten towards repentance. Moreover, there's another step. When we consciously avoid this repentance and confession, the danger of the inability to return to God, when habits reign over us, we submit to the habits and we become their slaves. Free will lost its independence permanently. Much harder to come out of that. But coming up, coming back to St. Porfirios, whose feast day is today, what a joy, what a man, what a saint, what great humility, how much love. Repentance and confession is the place where God's love meets man. St. Porfirios says, there's nothing higher than what is called repentance and confession. Nothing. This sacrament is the offering of God's love to mankind. It's the other way around than we think. It's the offering of God's love to mankind. God waiting to love us, to embrace us, to wash us, to clean us, to take that vestment from the Baptist that was white and pure, to restore it. To take the filth away, at times added up for years, smelling badly. He cannot hug us when we smell. This sacrament of repentance and confession is the offering of God's love to mankind. How beautiful. In this perfect way, a person is freed of evil. We go to confess and we feel our reconciliation with God. 
Joy enters us. Sin makes a person very confused psychologically. This confusion of sin does not dissipate whatever you do. Only in the light of Christ does the confusion depart. And St. Porfirio says, Christ makes the first move. You know what he says? Come to me, all who labor and I are heavy laden. Come to me, heavy laden by sin. Thereafter, we kick in. We must kick in. He doesn't say this. That's my word. But he says, thereafter, we accept this light in goodwill, which we express through our love towards him our prayers, and participating in the sacraments. There's need, St. Porfirio says, for the soul to first be awake. It is in this state of awakening that the miracle of repentance occurs. To be alert, to be awake, not asleep, aloof. This is where the human will plays its role. The individual on his own is unable to bring it about. God intervenes. Wake us up. Then divine grace comes. Without grace, a person cannot repent. I'd like you to hear this again. Young and old, without the grace of God, we cannot repent. Which is why our prayers from the prayer book, a reason to use the prayer book and not the Protestant TV shows, we pray, God, help me to repent. This is why we fast this season. This is why we pray this season, to repent. Without grace, a person cannot repent. The love of God does everything. He may use something, an illness or something else, it depends, in order to bring a person to repentance. And he speaks out of experience. He got sick. God allowed him to be sick so he could repent. So this is our St. Porfirios for today. And this is how, probably from the cross, the Lord Jesus Christ, knowing the hearts of all, also knows how we repent and confess. Along with this, I, as your father, know about your struggles. And I know about the struggles of many whom I served before in the bigger churches. And I can tell you that we lack repentance and confession. The door to the kingdom is not open unless we open it with great humility, approaching Christ to forgive our sins. We do ask for forgiveness of sins as we repent in front of the icon at home. We do that. But do you hear the prayer of forgiveness? Do you realize again that the church has instituted a process for this from the very first second out of love of God for us to be saved? Absolutely. So not be, let us not be deluded by the worldly other friends or television or whatever you might think about confessing and also about receiving Holy Communion. Confession is the washing, the cleansing of the vestment so we could enter the bridal feast. How can we enter to receive communion if we are not prepared? And I remember how the holy gifts come out and I say, the holy gifts are for those who are in good standing, who have prepared properly. This is one of the things that we must do to make effective the grace of God through the holy gifts. There are a few other ones before, but we must do this. At personal level, confession opens the gates, heals and gives strength to the one to deal with sickness and death. And how quickly do we run to the doctors, yet never come to confession when illness is hit? We say this anapoda in the other way, and upside down. But it also restores the relationship between man and God, between me and God. And I can tell from my own experience, when my sins pile up and I don't make it to my spiritual father, I'm in the dark. And you know what? 
you know it. You feel it. You know when your priest is in the dark. So I must run there. I must run there. But there's another benefit here. Confession brings the sinner back to Christ, which is the church. We all sin. We all sin. If you say, if there's anybody here who says, I don't have any sins, then step forward so we could proclaim you the second Christ. Through you, death will be trampled down by death again. There's no such thing. You know, there's another extreme here saying, Father, I'm so sinful that I cannot come for confession. The Father say this is demonic repentance. Demonic repentance. But uh, we all sin. Because we're a family, we sin against one another. And you know what sin does? It separates us from one another. It makes us people. We're called to be persons in communion. Every sin, every thought, every enmity, every disturbance that one we, we create against one another separates us. And the church becomes an organization. The church is when we become when we are one. And confession is so important in keeping us afloat on the right track, which is what? Our vision, the vision of Christ. Our church happens to have, thank God, the same vision that the church has, that, that Christ has to build his church, the body of Christ. So for us to be able to serve in ministries, the basic ones, starting from the altar here, with me as your priest, and ending with the usher there, and everything we do in the church, and of course in the families, we must have peace, we must receive forgiveness from God, we must return to Christ and be in Him. Not stand alone players, we must come back and return. Say nectarios now, not porfirios, commenting on this event of Christ giving peace and empowering His disciples to forgive, to remit sins or to bind sins. Comments, authority to bind and loose was given to preserve the holiness of the church, to preserve the holiness of the church and to fulfill her mission. Wow! Wow! This forgiveness and binding or the confession and repentance was given by Christ. Such that as the body, the, the church itself will stay pure. To allow others to come in in a healthy environment of a hospital that can heal. And by this fulfilling the mission. And the church of St. John Baptist in Carmel has to fulfill that mission too. And let us not be fooled by going after other things before we do this. As individuals. Let us be persons in Christ. We must preserve the wholeness of the church to fulfill the mission. Moreover, St. Nectario says, they who are burdened by sins and who delight in them and yet are in communion with the church, defile the church's sanctity and impede the role of her great mission. Wow. We can get in the way of the mission of Christ by being selfish and not stepping up. Moreover, St. Nectario says, they, st they store up for themselves great condemnation. So, what do we do? I think you need to be careful. St. Basil, saint of the fourth century, if you fear to approach in this mystery, you have prevented God's goodness and impeded his abundant kindness. In other words, it's coming upon us but we get in the way. So what do we do? We take courage and thank God for what we have. We have a clear path to salvation. As somebody mentioned in one of the podcasts I listened to, if, we, if you want to follow Christ, you must at least take a few steps with Him. All right, this is one of the steps we must take. And this season now preparing us for the great feast of the incarnation of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ is conducive to this. 
Let us ponder about these words, not upon mine, the sinful servant, but upon those of the saints. And reflect upon their model. See how they did. Look around us and see the darkness. And as the blind man in the gospel reading today raised a voice and with a loud cry, scream, Lord, have mercy on me. And if the Lord so happens to answer that, asking you, what would you like me to do for you? Simply respond, Lord, to restore my sight. And then the tears of repentance will come because you'll be in the presence of light. Will this be for 17 days, after 17 days, after 17 years or 1700 years? Yes, they will come. So my prayer for us today is that the good Lord will grant us a tearful advent with tears streaming from repentance and confession. Amen.